sometime this afternoon. Uh, but can we move on now to members' business in the name of James Dornan? And this is on congratulations to the Witch Campaign to call time on nuisance calls in Scotland. Uh, and as well as Mr Dornan, could I urge members or ask members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now? And I call on James Dornan to open the debate. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I'd like to start off by congratulating Witch on their continuing campaign to end the scourge of nuisance calls. Over the past two years, my office, I suspect, like many others, has received a disturbing number of complaints from constituents regarding the volume, timing and intimidating nature of these calls, which I've been plagued with myself. I hadn't realised that my memory was getting so bad that I kept on forgetting all these accidents that I had been involved in. But for me, it's a bit of a nuisance. For many of our most vulnerable citizens, this has led to scams that have deprived them of their savings, their security and their dignity. This is a vile practice and completely unacceptable. I mean, there's a, I have a number of um, examples here where people, one woman from Scotland who was done out of £6,000 for solar panels and once she handed over the money, she never heard from them again. There's a number, there's a, a number of other cases where people have been distressed by it, but where they've been severely affected by it, both financially and psychologically. Which has highlighted that 81% of Scots has received a nuisance call in the past month, with 41% of respondents citing a feeling of intimidation as a result. And they also report that 79% of people support greater accountability for the actions of these companies. As a Glasgow MSP, um, I, I'm delighted that I'm the one who's been able to raise this because uh, Glasgow unfortunately holds the title of having the largest amount of nuisance calls. 52% of calls made in Glasgow are nuisance calls and that is something that uh, obviously needs to be dealt with very seriously. I was delighted to see the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Keith Brown, uh, announce a £50,000 £50, fund to install call blocking technology for those most at risk on nuisance calls. I think this is a very important step forward. And, and presiding officer, this is an issue where I thought the whole chamber would agree on two things. One, that we all abhor these practices, and I believe we all do, I've got no doubts about that. But the other was to just welcome the Scottish Government's funding uh, uh, to introduce these new measures. And then I forgot about Mike Rumbles, didn't I? It appears that Mike Rumbles' tactics these days are to wait for a Scottish Government announcement claim it was his idea and then criticise the Scottish Government for not doing enough. Now, my mum used to tell me if I couldn't say anything nice, then not to say anything at all. So, it's advice I'd give to Mr Rumbles, but on that point, I think I'm going to move on. Uh, the, the Witch Campaign and the Task Force has highlighted a number of issues which is a shared responsibility across businesses, the industry regulatory bodies and, of course, government. Clearly, businesses should improve their direct marketing practices and ensure compliance with laws surrounding cons consumer consent to direct marketing is treated as a board-level issue under corporate risk and consumer trust. Also, active consideration should be given to join accreditation schemes. Boards should also commit to implementing the Information Commissioner's Office guidance on collecting and buying of data, ensure opt-outs are adhered to, respect a six-month time limit on third-party consent, and recognise that third-party consent is insufficient to override telephone preferences services. Red, a business therefore must ensure all telephone numbers purchased are screened and advanced. And finally, businesses should also record standard information as proof of consent. Industry bodies have the role to perform too. Codes of conduct should place an onus on their members to follow good practice in guiding and the purchasing, recording and sharing of personal consent. Any member found in breach of this practice should be accountable and face sanctions. The Competitions and Markets Authority should identify systemic harm to consumer protection and work closely with the ICO and fellow regulators to gain an understanding of the problems and identify what future action could be taken. The, the ICO has an opportunity to build on the existing market guidance to develop a model for firms to provide consumers with information on opting in and out, third-party consent and the controlling and revoking of consent. The new model uh, should be produced in tandem with other stakeholders such as the Chamber of Commerce, Federation of Small Businesses, voluntary sector organisations such as SCVO and GCVS. Ofcom should assess, in my view, Ofcom should assess what level consumer awareness of TPS has reached for landlines and mobile phone users and consider if there's need for increased awareness and then be at the forefront of any future campaigns. 
Of course, all these bodies and organisations should be closely collaborating anyway to dovetail their efforts in reducing the problems stemming from nuisance calls. And of course, presiding officer, there's a role for governments across the UK to take in the future to uh, help bring to an end the abuses of the current system. Firstly, directors or board level executives should be made legally accountable for any abuses in their firm's telecom marketing operations. At the moment, the company is fined for any transgressions. However, companies can be dissolved and reformed under new names with the same directors, the same addresses, the selling the same product, a practice known as phoenixing. Uh, directors and other responsible named individuals within firms may be a bit more mindful if the fines were going to be imposed on their personal finances instead of a firm which they can close the next day. Government should participate in cross-sector business awareness campaigns such as the ICO, Ofcom and others to encourage the adoption of accreditation schemes. The Department of Culture, Media and Sport should review the Nuisance Calls Action Plan to assess the recommendations and give consideration to any new recommendations. Also, government should adopt an anti-nuisance call, nuisance call policy in ex executing the procurement process for call centres. Finally, presiding officer, I'd, I'd like to draw the Chamber's attention to the Canadian National Do Not Call List, DNCL, which is designed to reduce the number of unwanted telemarketing calls. All telemarketers must be registered free of charge with the National DNCL. They must re they, consumers must register to have their mobile and home phone numbers included. Their details are added within 24 hours after registration and companies have 31 days to update their calling lists. Registration is permanent, however, consumers can have their details removed on request. Regular telemarketers include those who make calls to sell or promote a product or service, request or request donations. A subscription must be pursued for the purchase for the area codes intended for use and numbers must be downloaded from the national DNCL, then deleted from active calling lists, which firm must maintain but never call. If a consumer asks not to be contacted, their name and number must be added to internal do not call lists within 14 days and these numbers must never be called. The DNCL downloads used must be no older than 31 days. Firms must identify who they are and ensure the number is on display and they can only call between 9am and 9.30pm on weekdays and between 10am and 6pm on weekends. The guidance must be complied with at all times. Presiding officer, I'm sure we all have constituents who have been irritated or suffered worse from these calls, as I mentioned at the beginning, which have clearly demonstrated the public's feeling in this matter and have provided what I consider to be positive and realistic recommendations for business, industry bodies, regulators and government to implement and show leadership on. So therefore, I call upon everyone, particularly the Westminster government, whose locus this is mainly in, to play their part in ending this scourge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Dornan. Uh, normally these debates are at the end of the day, there's plenty of time, but today we're uh, quite restricted, so keep, uh, if members could keep their contributions to four minutes or less. Uh, I call Graham Day to be followed by Maurice Corrie. Graham Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, let me begin by wholeheartedly congratulating my friend and colleague, James Dornan, on securing this debate, even though I have a depressing feeling of deja vu and rising to contribute to it. This is the third such debate I've taken part in, the two previous occasions being in 2012 and almost two years ago to the day. We are making progress on the issue of nuisance calls, let's acknowledge that, but the fact we still have cause to consider it in the Chamber shows there is some considerable way left to go. And it's a hugely important issue, deserving of all possible action on the part of government at all levels. Back at the beginning of 2016, I hosted an event for which to inform members about its nuisance calls campaign. Ahead of that, I was interviewed on Good Morning Scotland. Trailing the interview, BBC Scotland ran a package in which members of the public were taking great delight in recalling how they personally dealt with these calls. Some had old abuse or wound up the callers while others blew whistles down the phone. The thing is, I've never found this matter remotely amusing. It's all very well and good for those of us who can to wind up or be abrupt in dealing with these callers. But some people, many people, do not feel able to put the phone down, let alone send the callers, that, that is if there's anyone on the other end, packing. For them, these calls are an absolute intrusion, and perhaps even worse, if they are in any way vulnerable. And it is frankly unacceptable that these folk reach the stage where they are unwilling to answer their phone. From the previous debates we've had in this place on this subject, one contribution has stuck with me. It was made by Liam MacArthur, who revealed to the chamber that he had an elderly constituent who'd been pers persuaded over the phone to purchase an internet security package, even though she didn't own a computer. 
For me, that sums up the risks associated with this practice and illustrates exactly why, as I noted earlier, governments at all levels must take every possible action to deal with it. President Officer, I welcome the Scottish Government's recently published action plan. Powers over this matter largely remain at, at Westminster, but there has been some limited devolution here, and it's important we seize the opportunity that provides. And of course, the Scottish Government itself was innocently caught up in this issue a couple of years ago when rogue companies were cold calling, claiming to be doing so on behalf of the government to inform people they had to replace their central heat and boilers. I had a number of constituents get in touch and my staff had to reassure them that the Scottish government was demanding no such thing. People should be confident that a call purporting to be from or on behalf of the Scottish government is legitimate. I therefore welcome the measures announced in the Scottish government action plan in relation to this particular aspect, as I do the provision of call blocking technology for vulnerable people and awareness raising about protection options. I also note the call for a simpler reporting system. James Dornan referenced earlier the situation in Canada. I won't rehearse that in detail again. Um, suffice to say uh, that whilst introducing such measures here may not reduce people's annoyance about calls, they would certainly afford an opportunity to determine whether the source is a, is, uh, a number they recognise or to get details to report the call if they so wish. Presiding officer, this problem isn't going away. If anything, it's growing in scale and annoyance value, which is data from September last year shows that 39% of calls people receive were nuisance calls. The research, as is noted by the Scottish Government, also shows that there is more of an issue here in Scotland. The voluntary steps that the Scottish Government can encourage businesses to take are, of course, welcome and would serve to highlight the firms not acting in this way. But unfortunately, we will always have companies which do not want to comply with what many of us might see as minimal best practice. And it is about having a will across government, frankly, to drive these cowboys out of business. Which is campaign is called Calling Time and Nuisance Calls and Texts. I sincerely hope that across the lifetime of this Parliament, we manage to persuade Westminster to act more decisively in this area than it has until now, and we can indeed call time on nuisance calls. Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. Maurice Courage, be followed by James Kelly. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to start by thanking James Dornan uh, for bringing this very important issue to the members' debate today, which, as we know, have conducted a great campaign to raise awareness, awareness of this widespread issue that affects so many people throughout the country. And according to their figures, nine out of 10 Scots received some form of nuisance call in the month prior to the launching of their petition. In fact, the majority of members here in the chamber today will have been on the receiving end of one of these calls. Whether it is regarding personal payment insurance, otherwise known as PPI, or the possibility of being in a car accident that wasn't your fault, these calls are not always without their merits. For example, some of my constituents have received PPI compensation to which they are entitled highlighted as a result of receiving a relevant phone call. There is, of course, a point at which these calls become a nuisance. That said, there are far more sinister, sinister phone calls which have a varying effect on different groups within our society. It is the most vulnerable of these that we need to ensure that we protect. Last year, there were over 1.8 million cases of financial fraud reported in the UK, which resulted in the total loss of £768 million. A large percentage of these were the result of unsolicited calls. Within my region, and more specifically Western Bartonshire, there was a recent sophisticated telephone scam which, which involves constituents being contacted by an organisation claiming to be Scottish Water regarding contaminated water supply and informing them to visit a Pacific website for more information, the purpose of which was, in fact, to receive their personal information. Many other members will have heard similar stories from their constituents. One point that was raised by which, within their petition, was the importance of protecting the most vulnerable groups in our society and helping to ensure that they are aware of ways to prevent these nuisance calls. For example, BT now provide on their phones, as we all know, uh, BT Call Guardian, which enables the homeowner to save numbers and block unwanted calls. It is important that those who would benefit from such a device are made aware of these benefits and availability. Given the scale of the problem in Scotland and the fact that these nuisance calls are ever on the rise, we must be more robust in our approach to preventing them. Perhaps when the Scottish Government is looking at this matter, it could consider bringing some more awareness and attention to what constitutes a breach of law to help businesses stay within the regulations, as well as cracking down on businesses who do break the law on nuisance phone calls and holding the relevant business executives to account where it occurs personally. 
Going forward, it is vital that we as a parliament do not produce or create policies which encourage, whether directly or indirectly, an increase in unwanted telephone calls in order to protect vulnerable groups so as not to add to general nuisance calls which the vast majority of us have experienced in our lifetime. In conclusion, presiding officer, it would appear that the genuine issues such as PPI, which affect a large number of individuals, could be dealt with in a less direct and intrusive way, such as through television, radio campaigns, which provide awareness to the public without causing nuisance and, or in some cases cause alarm to the people in their own homes. In my opinion, we should be protecting people and their right to privacy and peace within their own home and doing everything we can to prevent nuisance calls in the future. Thank you. Admiral Timekeeping, Mr Curry. James Kelly to be followed by Bruce Crawford. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start off by congratulating James Dornan on securing uh, today's debate on a very important issue, and an issue that, that I know Mr Dornan has a consistent record uh, campaigning on. And I think it is an issue that, um, that you know, every member across the chamber will not only have personal experience of, but will have been approached by constituents in their regions and constituencies uh, expressing real concern and anxiety about it. And I think from that point of view, we should congratulate the work uh, which, which uh, has consistently done in raising awareness around this issue and uh, prompting action from governments uh, and business on this issue. I think when you look at the scale of the problem, you know, 81% uh, of people have received a nuisance call in the last month. But it's not just the numbers. It's uh, as Graham Day spoke about in his contribution, and I remember his, his excellent contribution in the debate that I hosted uh, two years ago on this issue. Um, it's, it's the impact that it has on vulnerable people, um, particularly pensioners. Uh, not everyone, you know, can just dismiss a, a phone call that you know comes down the line. Uh, some pensioners feel difficult to have difficulty in putting the phone down and sometimes feel that the calls are genuine and you know what is, what is really despicable about it is that these companies a lot of them uh, are up to scams and they're out to try and uh, elicit people's bank details in order to uh, participate in fraudulent uh, uh, fraudulent activities and uh, take uh, money off people uh, 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 through uh, unjust means, um, and I think that's you know that that's what gets to the, the nub of the issue and causes the the real concern and alarm. I think in terms of how the issue should be combated, there's a number of things that can be done. Uh, first of all, around information awareness, which uh, which have been very active on. Um, I know that I had a recent meeting with the, the local Citizens Advice Bureau in Rutherglen and Canvas Lang and that Sharon Hampson and the team there have been very effective in getting the which uh, packs out over the, the course of the, the campaign that they've been running. And that makes people aware of the activities of these uh, nuisance callers and, and helps combat them. On a practical le level, as a number of speakers have highlighted, I think it's important to support the, the introduction of call blocking technology and that can cut a lot of these uh, calls off its source and ensure that they don't get through to people. I think there's got to be more a responsibility on companies, those who uh, participate in, in uh, telephone activities, some will obviously do legitimately, but there has to be, uh, there has to be an onus on those companies to ensure that their activities uh, don't in, uh, in, don't interfere with people's uh, personal freedoms. I think from that point of view, the the which campaign in order to ensure that uh, companies have a director who's responsible uh, for, uh, for for telephone calls at director level uh, ensures that they take on uh, more responsibility. Finally, obviously, action across all governments uh, is absolutely essential. And from that point of view, I do welcome the Scottish Government's action plan. So in summing up, uh, an excellent debate has been brought forward by James Dorn and it affects many people. And there's an onus on uh, us all, MSPs, governments, companies and information campaigns to provide leadership in order that we combat the, 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 these uh, ineffective nuisance calls.
Thank you. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Jamie Halcrow johnson Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. First of all, like others, can I thank James Dornan for bringing this very important matter to the Chamber today. Nuisance scholars sometimes on an hourly basis continue to harass and abuse many people across my constituency, and I know it's the same across the country. And I'd like to use my time today to focus the effect of nuisance scholars on vulnerable older people, those who might be suffering from dementia or similar, similar debil debilitating illness who are at home alone. In my own constituency, I'm aware of one harrowing such case of an older person who reached out for advice after being co contacted by someone claiming to be from HMRC. This was a particularly aggressive form of fraudulent nuisance call that attempted to persuade my constituent to pay tax they claim she was liable for. The caller suggested that she should do this by purchasing iTunes vouchers, passing on the relevant codes and threatening her with court action if she did not comply. Thankfully though, although highly distressed by the situation, my constituent questioned the validity of the caller's claims and eventually contacted Police Scotland to report the incident. Others will not have had such a fortunate end story. This particular case demonstrates only one of the more sinister attempts to victimise vulnerable older people. And it's clear to see how such messages cause alarm and distress among those who are on the receiving end. And the problem is huge. According to research conducted by Age UK, Telephone scams affect more than 10% of people aged over 65, meaning that over 100,000 older people in Scotland have been targeted. 12% of those who were contacted responded to scams. However, for the over age 75 group, that figure rises to 16%. It's clear, therefore, that the older and more vulnerable person they are, the more profitable they are seen by these predatory companies and individuals who would seek to exploit them. These figures demonstrate a sickening reality in our society where vulnerable people are being used, but perhaps the more appropriate term is abused uh, in these cases. And people are losing to what for them are vast amount sums of money to opportunistic and vile sharks who relentlessly deploy scare tactics against them. Nearly two-thirds of people who've been scammed have not reported it, even many stating they were too embarrassed to even tell their close family or their friends. President Officer, from this debate today, I think there's one thing that should ring out loud and clear, is that no one should ever be afraid or embarrassed when it comes to nuisance calls. These, to use a very descriptive Scottish word, sleek at callers are good at what they do and can be very persuasive but that does not mean they cannot be stopped. Report it to the police, speak to your friends and family, and let those around you know that people are being targeted in this way. I welcome the Scottish Government's investment into blocking, uh, blocking, call blocking technology for the most vulnerable people. It will bring some peace of mind to many older people, but there's still a lot of work to do to stamp out this activity by raising awareness, and I hope the debate that James Dornan's brought forward today achieves just that, because it's probably the biggest thing that we can do from this particular um, debate. His motion also draws an attention to other further action that we can, can be taken to improve matters, so I thank him for bringing this debate to the Chamber today. Thank you, Mr Crawford. I call Jamie Halker johnson Mr Halker johnson please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I firstly refer members to my register of interest in relation to the business of J. Halker Johnson & Sons, which I refer to in my speech. Um, I also congratulate James Dornan for bringing this debate. Uh, I welcome an opportunity to debate what's an important issue uh, for my constituents in the Highlands and Islands, and what, one which is causing increasing frustration and in many cases alarm. Other members have spoken uh, of the extent of the problem with nuisance calls in Scotland, but in addition to the wide level of irritation shown by calls and surveys, which showed that 40% of the people surveyed were also intimidated by the calls. Ofcom's research showed around one in 10 people found the calls distressing. These are naturally the most serious concerns, but for many of us, they're a nuisance, but I would ask members to consider the following scenarios, one that is likely to be played out across the highlands and islands at times. You're an older person, you live in a remote location, you live alone. In the middle of the night, the phone rings. You've no idea who it is, but you answer. There's no one at the end of the line. 
You don't know if it's just another nuisance call. You don't know if it's a family member or friend urgently in need of help. You don't know if it's something more sinister. So let's be very clear, nuisance calls aren't just a nuisance. For many, particularly the elder, elderly and the vulnerable, they can feel like an intrusion into their home. Now some people are being forced to make themselves almost uncontactable to friends and relatives simply to get peace from persistent callers or the volume of calls from separate organizations. And I'd like to touch on the experience of some in the Highlands and Islands particularly, including a personal one. We, both as a farming business and on domestic numbers, receive calls consistently from uh, a nuisance calls. Calls from overseas call centers, which almost immediately hang up the minute they're questioned. Calls that ring, but no one at the other end when answered. And recently, and most frustratingly, calls from companies which claim, and with some justification in some cases, to be from organizations partnered or working with the very providers who have a role in providing services and which should be working to combat nuisance calling. Only a few weeks ago at our farm, we received a call from an organization claiming to, be, uh, a BT, our BT, sorry, claiming to be that our BT contract was coming to an end, needing to be renewed, and a deal was, new deal was available. This was done, and a sign-up um, confirmations were sent from BT themselves. However, when I rang BT, they clarified that our contract still had well over a year to run. They also admitted the company that contacted, contacted us were authorized by BT to sign up customers on their behalf. So we were contacted by an organization that appears to have a relationship with BT, but which is cold calling BT customers and maybe customers from other providers and selling them services simply, they simply don't need. And BT had done nothing to question this new and unnecessary, contra uh, unnecessary contract despite it being on the records. I'm sure we've all heard of utilities providers providing details to partner organizations, which they then use for what are essentially cold calling sales. That certainly seems to be the case in my own example, and I'll be writing to BT to highlight um, our case and ascertain what protections apply for these data sharing arrangements. And it's not just the utilities. In 2014, Highland Trading Standards even reported scam calls coming from organizations representing themselves as being able to prevent nuisance calls. Um, and just uh, not, not necessarily to keep James Dorman happy, but I hopefully he will, I do welcome the action taken by the Scottish Government in relation to nuisance call, including the increase in provision of call blocking technology as part of a UK-wide work taking place following the March 2015 budget. And of course, which has been working closely with the UK regulators to signpost nuisance calls and tackle them under the current legislation. This has paid off with a £350,000 fine issued to a PPI sales company in September for an incredible 146 million unsolicited calls. But there's also an important role for service providers to play too, whether that's identifying and cutting off the offending companies at source or in providing better systems or equipment which prevents calls reaching the home or the businesses being targeted. Combating these calls requires government, regulators, business, and public bodies to work together. I'd like to conclude um, with another example of the real impact these calls can have on examples. It has, I don't think you've got time to do with another example. If you okay. must conclude, please. Well, I'll just move on and say these calls are not nuisance calls, and they're certainly not victimless. Thank you very much. I wanted to make space for Liam MacArthur. Mr MacArthur, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I too thank uh, James Dornan uh, for bringing this debate um, and also assure him that I will in, um, take him off the mailing list for Mike Rumble's press releases in future. Uh, can I also join others in thanking uh, Whitch for their tireless campaigning on this uh, issue? I think, uh, as Graham Day said, there has been pr uh, progress here and they deserve much of the credit uh, for that. But as everybody has pointed out, there is a considerable amount still to do. These are not simply a nuisance. I think. Um, a number of colleagues have, have highlighted the scams and the financial loss, particularly for some of our uh, most vulnerable people in the communities we represent. And I think Graham Day uh, quite rightly drew attention to the most egregious example that I, I outlined in a, in a previous uh, debate. But it is also distressing, it is also isolating. I got sent an email earlier this week from a constituent who works in the care sector. And she says, I work with the elderly in their homes and many will have several calls a day claiming to be government boiler schemes, etc. They try to get down to the phone too fast and put themselves at risk physically. She also goes on to highlight the particular problems for dementia sufferers and how distressing they can uh, find it. But boiler schemes do appear to be um, the source of many of the, the problems at the moment. I welcome the, the Scottish Government's uh, action programme and indeed the commitment from the Cabinet Secretary's colleague, uh, Kevin Stewart, who uh, confirmed that the Scottish Government for none of their schemes use this method of calling. The UK Government and the correspondence I've had with them I haven't been able to offer a, a, a similar commitment. I think that's an area perhaps 
uh, that further work needs to be uh, done. But for now, uh, can I again thank James Dornan for um, bringing this debate, allowing Parliament again to send a strong and unambiguous message about uh, the attitude this Parliament takes to nuisance calls and our commitment to continue uh, efforts to eradicate it. And thank again which for their, uh, as I say, tireless efforts uh, on this particular issue. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Ms McArthur. I call on Keith Brown to close for the Government Cabinet Secretary. Seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Well, not seven minutes, six minutes or thereabouts, please. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. Can I uh, also congratulate James Donham for securing this debate and also commend the work of my colleague Patricia Gibson, MP, in the House of Commons for the work that she's done, which has led to some of the developments in terms of penalties uh, now being proposed. Uh, I chaired the Nuisance Calls Commission and very recently published an action plan highlighting what the Scottish Government will do to reduce the impact of these calls, given the powers that we have. Uh, as the motion says, which have been pretty relentless in bringing attention to this issue, and quite rightly, and I mean relentless in the most positive sense, we've worked very closely with which, uh, and I'm grateful for their work, not only to help consumers protect themselves, but also to highlight the particular scale of the problem in Scotland. Uh, research, as we mentioned, uh, showing uh, three Scottish cities were receiving the highest percentages of nuisance calls in the UK. It's clear that we have to do what we can do in the Scottish Government, although regulation lies with the UK Government. We know that the rise of what are called nuisance calls harm individuals. Uh, for most, they are, as Graham Day said, a recurring annoyance, interrupting dinner or family time, and sometimes unforgivably, I'm sure James Dornan can relate to this arriving just as the Champions League coverage starts. But for some people, uh, circumstances, uh, who, uh, people are very uh, particularly vulnerable. The consequences can be much worse, and they can be a source of anxiety, distress, or even financial hardship. We all know the story, some of which you've heard today, about people conned out of savings, are frightened every time they answer the phone, and they don't want to just stop using the phone because they want to be available uh, for family members. Uh, and they fear the worst every time the phone rings, only to be offered, as Liam MacArthur mentioned, uh, perhaps a boiler deal they are not interested in having. Although Bruce Crawford's example, I think, is one that I've had as well. It seems so random and so odd that somebody would pretend to be from the uh, tax uh, revenue and ask people to go and purchase iTunes vouchers. It just seems very odd, but this is a very common um, situation. And I had a constituent as well who was told uh, to go immediately to Tesco's to buy these and not tell anybody about uh, the call. She's an older woman and was only stopped from leaving her home by somebody else who she did mention it to in confidence. Um, and the effect that would have had on that woman in terms of paying tax, which she had no liability for, would have been uh, substantial. But also the concern and the anxiety that were caused were unforgivable. So it can be much more than a, a nuisance call. And I do think it's a serious, a very serious issue. And that's certainly been brought home during the Nuisance Calls Commission. I would say that on the Mike Rumble's press release, I mean, I just think it's puerile, miserable and ill-informed. And it doesn't treat the issue as seriously as it should be treated. There's also, I think, a councillor in Angus has again just used it as a, a means of having a go at the Scottish Government without having informed themselves about the powers that we have or don't have. Um, I think it's very important to realise where the power lies in relation to some of the regulatory aspects of this. We can do some things, and that's why we've launched a fund to supply call blocking technology to some of our most vulnerable citizens. Uh, Trading Standards Scotland have worked very closely with the third sector organisations to make sure the call blockers go where they're most needed. And almost all units have already been allocated. And some local authorities have done a great deal of work in this area, especially in areas where they know there are collections or uh, an intensity in, in terms of numbers of people who are vulnerable. So we're very pleased by the take-up, but it is yet another indicator of how many people these calls affect, which I think leads me on to the suggestion that Ofcom follow the Canadian model, as mentioned again by James Dornan, of requiring telecoms providers to provide technological uh, uh, solutions. Only a solution that blocks calls on a dramatic scale can really change the pattern of nuisance calls. And telecoms providers are best placed to make that happen. However, Ofcom have explained to the commission that we held that Canada are further behind the UK system, which uh, explains why the regulator has imposed a duty. So their position remains that imposing one here would have little tangible impact. Uh, now, we are, despite this, seeing some positive steps. BT, despite what was said quite rightly by... Uh, 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 I remember previously, and Vodafone, for example, offer free services to their customers that put them in control of who can contact them. Nonetheless, even people who subscribe, for example, to the telephone preference uh, system are not immune to receiving these calls. 
Um, so we'd like to see telecom providers uh, do more to follow the lead of BT and, and Vodafone in this area. And I've written to the UK government to urge further action if the market themselves don't provide the solutions, and I believe the UK government should act. In that same letter, I also urged swift action on both director accountability, which is being taken forward, and a ban on cold calling on pensions specifically. And the potential harm for those most at risk is too great to delay this for much longer. That I had to write the letter in the first place highlights that we are uh, very constrained in the actions that we can take. I know there's been some criticism that the Commission uh, did not achieve enough or didn't go far enough, and I don't accept that. If anybody here has a suggestion about an action you, the Scottish Government can take that we haven't considered and proposed in terms of awareness raising, call blocking technology, they had the chance to write in and tell us that, and they didn't do that. And even now, I'm willing to accept any further suggestions if we can help uh, reduce the, the plague on people's lives that this uh, represents. Uh, so if I can, though, end on a more positive note and highlight the progress that's been brought about by the Commission, even with the limited powers. I've mentioned the call blocking fund, but the action plan sets out a number of other steps, including our commitment to building a wider scams strategy so that vulnerable people are protected from all kinds of unscrupulous practices, amending the business pledge uh, to include support and protection for vulnerable customers, and also ensuring that Scottish government schemes, such as the Home Energy Efficiency Initiatives, are developed in a way that minimises the opportunities for rogue companies to hide them and prey on vulnerable people and the launch of the plan marked the beginning of a consumer awareness week on nuisance calls which we obviously worked with which on me I think James Dorn and one or two others also appeared uh, at Glasgow Central Station to lend their support to Witch's campaign and also again as mentioned by James Kelly Citizens Advice Scotland involved in the Commission as were many other people and have been instrumental in leading work to raise awareness so that consumers can better protect themselves and their loved ones and that collaborative working underpins the actions in the plan as the only way to solve the problem so I would encourage all my colleagues in Parliament to join me in continuing to press for more UK government action where necessary and to finding our own solutions where possible. Thank you very much. That